Hello, my name is Brian Hansen, and I'm Vice President for Studies here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I want to welcome everybody to this program, uh, most especially our members and supporters. Appreciate all you do to make these kinds of programs possible. Uh, this is an on-the-record program, and there will be an opportunity for you to participate by asking questions. In order to do so, uh, you can open a new window in your browser and go to CCGA Live where you can sit, submit a question or vote on one that has already been submitted by someone else. As a reminder, the Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan organization. The views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent the institutional positions of the Council. And with that, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Lieutenant General Nina Armiano is the Director of Staff at Headquarters U.S. Space Force in Washington, D.C., where she is responsible for synchronizing and integrating policy, plans, positions, procedures, and cross-functional issues for the headquarters staff. We'll learn what that means in a little bit. Uh, prior to her current assignment, she was Director of Space Programs at the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Her experience in space systems and operations includes combat uh, mission ready operator, instructor evaluator, flight commander and strategic missile warning, space surveillance, space control, space launch, and theater missile warning system uh, systems. She has also served our country in a number of other uh, capacities, and we're very grateful to you for your service. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you so much, Lieutenant General, for joining us today. Thank you very much for your invitation, and I'm pleased to join your public webinar series. Uh, Dr. Hansen, thank you, uh, Brian, for, for moderating today. Um, please be kind. Um, I, uh, you know, you're talking to a Chicago kid here. I grew up in Oak Park. I went to high school at OPRF, uh, Oak Park River Forest High School for, for one year before the family moved to Dundee. And that's where I finished out before I went to the Air Force Academy. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm not, you know, you can take the girl out of Chicago, but you can't take Chicago out of me. Uh, the Bears last week uh, helped, or this week, last Sunday. Yeah. Um, you know, it was scary, but uh, in the end, they pulled it off, and, and I think they're starting the season pretty well. And uh, our Cubbies, go Cubs, and the White Sox are even looking good, too. So um, my husband is an Indians fan, and he says, you can't have two teams. You have to choose. And, um, well. And? And, well, okay, it's Cubs. It's Cubs. But. <laughs> But if it comes, well, and then he made me promise if it comes down to the White Sox and Indians that I, you know, for the good of my marriage, I have to go Indians. So we'll see about that. But I know. We all, yeah, tough. we all make compromises of various <laughs> lines. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's great to have you on here in Chicago. And we look forward to a time to uh, have you here uh, in person back when that is, or when that's a thing again. Um, but really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us and share with us uh, about the U.S. Space Force. Of course, it's, you know, this new service that was just established at the um, end of last year and is obviously the newest branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Can you share with us just a little bit of a background about kind of what was the motivation for creating the Space Force and kind of what are your, your major um, missions and operations? Absolutely. Uh, before I, I get into that, I, I just want to kind of make a statement that I'm going to, you know, hopefully use to maybe frame my, you know, everything here. Great. And that is, um, I really believe every American has a responsibility for our national defense. And that doesn't mean every American should, you know, sign up to be in the Army, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Navy, or now the Space Force. Um, however, uh, I do believe that every American should, should feel a sense of responsibility to participate in our national defense. And that means, you know, listening to, uh, you know, events like this, uh, thinking about what it means valuing space and you know i do think space is worth defending um, but you know bringing american ingenuity innovation and ideas into space and into the space force i think will make our nation even stronger 
and uh, and and it is worth protecting. You know, you know, Chicago's uh, water and power systems rely on space. The you know the timing to run those systems comes from space. It comes from the GPS constellation, that same constellation that provides for the app on your phone or uh, the timing for banking and communications and even the chip in your car. I mean, the information comes from satellites in space. And without space, our American way of life would be very different. Um, in the military, we are the best in the world in space. We're the best in the world at providing those capabilities. I mentioned uh, the GPS constellation is run, commanded, controlled, operated by uh, the United States Space Force. We provide military satellite communications. That's protected communications for the president and our troops on the ground and our nuclear command and control uh, capabilities. We provide weather satellites and, and all that data uh, helps not only the military uh, predict and understand weather, but also you know, the rest of our nation and even the globe. And of course we launch rockets. We, we launch rockets for our nation from both Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg uh, uh, bases where I've been the commander, lucky, lucky enough to be the commander of both of those bases. So we are, we're the best in the world at doing this. Um, and what we provide is critical to our joint force on the ground. So uh, our, our airmen, sailors, soldiers, Marines all around the world rely very heavily on space. Um, that is both a good and a bad thing. It's great because it's cutting edge technology, but the other side of that coin is that our adversaries know that we rely on this capability and they have started to think about space as our Achilles heel. That's why we established the Space Force. Um, very specifically, it's Russia and China, and I know we can, we can talk a little bit more about them and why, um, but very specifically, um, by the year 2025, they're gonna be able to threaten all of our United States space assets in every orbital regime. That's the low Earth orbit where we have our intelligence satellites and weather satellites. Uh, the medium Earth orbit is the home of GPS. And then the geostationary Earth orbit is where we have our most high value assets, our strategic communication satellites, as I mentioned previously, and our strategic missile warning satellites. If, if we can't protect and defend those capabilities and, and everything we deliver from space, we will lose in in, in competition, and we will certainly lose if conflict extends into space. That's why the Space Force was established. So back um, a number of years ago, 40, 50 years ago, there was a decision made to demilitarize space um, uh, quite intentionally to try to remove it from an area of competition. And you've talked about uh, how there are new threats there. And you've, you've talked about very, uh, very comprehensively all the ways in which we rely on um, on things that are in space and technologies that are in space, particularly in our society and our military, which is so technologically um, oriented. Um, to what extent is there been a change in, and help us understand this change from um, the 1960s when space was seen as, okay, we'll just share it uh, and, and, and intentionally not militarize it, to now where this has become a domain of concern, of military concern. It, it has, um, uh, and I think that you're re referencing, um, there's a, uh, a UN space treaty from 1960 that banned the use of nuclear weapons in space. Uh, 1976, the Outer Space Treaty restricts the use of space to only peaceful purposes, um, but never, uh, you know, even with those uh, laws and, and uh, treaties in place, um, never has the United States abandoned space as a domain, uh, not only for peaceful purposes, but 
to provide uh, communications and uh, intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance from space. I, you know, back in um, the 60s, it was much more highly classified. Uh, we talk much more openly about it today, um, but we do realize it was a benign environment. It, it was a friendly and a peaceful environment, um, but there are, there's evidence and we are growing more and more comfortable about talking about the evidence that we're finding that both Russia and China are building uh, basically weapons in space. And, and when I say the, our Achilles heel, that, you know, they've been studying us for years, ever since the Gulf War. Back in the 80s, they've been studying how we fight. And, and our forces have become increasingly dependent on space because those capabilities are, are exquisite. And, and um, you know, they, they give our fighting forces an edge. And so uh, we've been tracking evidence that Russia and China are putting weapons in space, therefore weaponizing the domain. Therefore, we need to protect and defend what we have in space. And um, to the extent you can, tell us a little bit about what's involved with that and, and some of the missions. I mean, you, you laid out this really compelling um, a picture of how dependent we are on, on satellite technology, which of course are very vulnerable. They're up there a long way. It's one thing to have an asset on the ground in the United States and defend it or a military base abroad, but out in space, obviously it's, it's much more vulnerable because um, you don't have that level of protection. Right. So how do you go about protecting those, those assets and, and systems? What kinds of things does, does one, what kinds of activities do you have to do in order to do that? There's, a, there's quite a bit to think through. Uh, all of the capabilities I've been mentioning were designed and built for the benign environment. So they don't have any protections. They have zero protection. <laughs> so um, we're thinking through a series of onboard type of protections so that when a satellite is designed and built, it can have the ability to see what's around it. You know, right today, um, the satellite systems are reliant on uh, what we can observe from the from Earth. We have a series of radars and optical telescopes, and we even use some commercial capabilities uh, to observe all objects in space. And sometimes, most most of the time, you can see objects around. Uh, you know, a high value asset. But if they're small enough and if they're far away enough and if it's a threatening object, our current satellites don't have the capability to see that coming. And if it's small enough, our ground base may not have the capability to see it coming, if you will. Um, so we have to design our satellites in a way that they can have some own, their own self-defense. You know, one of them is, is understanding their environment, having a sensor that would understand the, you know, it, its immediate environment, kind of like a, almost like a radar warning type, you know, if, if something is coming its way. And then secondly, an, on, an onboard capability to maybe move out of the way. You know, right now satellites have just enough fuel to survive their primary mission. And that's been all, you know, planned and designed once again for a benign environment. If that environment becomes hostile, uh, there's not enough fuel to move out of the way, for example, of, of uh, any threat that's coming at them. Um, we're considering the idea of um, offboard type of protections as well. Maybe other satellites are acting as defenders. Uh, we're we're also taking a look at, instead of designing these, you know, I call uh, Taj Mahal type satellites where they're, they're super exquisite and they do many, many things. Um, because again, in a benign environment, a satellite has been outlasting its design life. And, you know, why not just add a bunch of sensors on it so it'll continue to, you know, uh, 
survive and thrive. But in the environment that I described that's coming, we want to uh, build actually simpler satellites, not exquisite one of a kind that actually do take about 20 years from con conception to delivery and launch. I mean, it's, um, that's too long. That's, that's, you know, we have to uh, cut down our acquisition timelines. We have to uh, design simpler. And then we we're looking at the architectures themselves. Today, uh, part of the vulnerability is that these systems are basically stovepiped. So you have a satellite that can only communicate to its single ground command and control. Think, you know, envision an operation center where people are, are monitoring the satellite. And then, you know, very specific user communications or user terminals. And so that, that's a vulnerability because that stovepiped system, um, it's vulnerable to cyber attacks, on orbit type of attacks. And um, we're exploring breaking down those cylinders of excellence, if you will, and uh, creating maybe perhaps a single operations floor that could command and control all the different kinds of satellites that we have. Um, it, uh, it, you know, creating layers of capability, smaller, cheaper, replaceable satellites in, in, in layered orbits, hybrid orbits, uh, distributed orbits, so that it's no longer a stovepiped, uh, vulnerable, almost like a single shot. Uh, it, we wanna complicate our adversaries, um, uh, you know, we wanna complicate their thinking, we wanna complicate the targets they're looking at, and this is one way to, to do it. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one of the ways in which I can imagine spaces may become more complicated as an environment to be operating is uh, the development of private companies who've, who are involved in space, whether it's um, satellite systems and communication systems, if it's companies like SpaceX and Virgin Atlantic, which talk about, you know, hopes of travel and tourism. Um, how does that fit into considerations in terms of, of your mission and operation? Because I could imagine, you know, in some ways we're also reliant on some of those commercial uh, systems. Absolutely. And they're, you know, they're, they see space as a new domain as well. You know, it, uh, for example, uh, SpaceX, as, as you mentioned, um, Virgin Galactic, uh, Blue Origin, and there, there's many, many others who are looking at space as potentially uh, a, a profitable venture. Um, and so in those hybrid architectures I was just mentioning, we're also going to use commercial capabilities. And, and for years, you would never hear of the military, you know, even considering using anything commercial, but um, they've certainly proven um, that they're more, uh, right now, more nimble, agile, adaptable, and uh, they, their acquisition um, life cycles are, are much more rapid, and we want to tap into those capabilities. So part of that hybrid architecture I was talking about is using commercial capabilities. Interesting. Uh, one of the other things that strikes me that could be complicated in the realm of space is um, there are a lot, we have a great set of allies that have been very important, are very important to the defense of the United States. And we have issues on the military front of interoperability um, kind of issues that I can imagine are linked to space, uh, space technologies, as well as they may have capabilities that are important for us uh, to be able to, to protect. To what extent is there um, cooperation or involvement of our allies in in this domain like there is in you know naval exercises and you know in other areas of of military we have a, a very strong group of allies in fact um, 
there, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about the laws and policies for in space. Well, in reality, it's not a very regulated area. It's, it's almost like the Wild West. And so what we've done is, um, and, and I think it's even more powerful than writing laws and rules, um, we're actually bringing co a coalition of allies together um, to prevent conflict, conflict and promote cooperation. So the, the, the more allies we bring together, um, the more that also complicates an adversary's calculus um, be, because uh, space is around the globe, it's ubiquitous around the globe, all nations touch it. Um, if you disturb the space domain, it's, it's not just the United States that's affected. And so really the more allies that we can bring to the table, the better. And, and we have quite a few um, forums. Uh, we have an a combined operations center now at Vandenberg Air Force Base, where we have uh, uh, Canada and Australia, the United Kingdom, we have uh, a German and French, we have German and French operators in, in that uh, op center and, and it's growing. We know Japan and South Korea are interested as well. Um, so we, we have an op center, we have forums where we come together and talk about space defense and the defense of that domain. We share data and that is growing uh, as well. It's just there's there's a there's a lot, um, and and I think that's that's one of the areas to me that is particularly exciting. Yeah, do other countries have anything analogous to the to the Space Corps, or, or are we the the you know I suppose leaders in in this area? Most countries have some kind of space uh, organization, if not military, uh, but France actually has a, a air and space force. Uh, it's relatively new, it's, it's certainly 2020. And um, I just saw uh, an article about the, the establishment in September, this month. So potential partners to, uh, to, to work with here. Uh, one of the concerns when uh, over, during the discussion of creating a, a space core was um, whether or not it might fuel increasing um, arms race or competition um, in, in space and as opposed to reduce or make it more secure, the possibility of inadvertently um, making space less secure. How do you all think about that and how should we think about uh, the best way to, to end up where we want to be, which is a, a more secure uh, environment in space? We definitely want uh, the goal is definitely a more secure environment in space. Um, I believe that, uh, I, you know, and I've, I've certainly seen the arguments on, uh, on both sides. Uh, I think the Space Force was number one established to protect United States assets in space. Um, and it was born out of the threats that we've been seeing for a few years. Uh, back in 2007, just as an example, uh, and it's, it's pretty well known, giant, China launched a, an ASAT, an anti-satellite missile, at one of their defunct weather satellites um, as a demonstration. Uh, you know, otherwise, why else would you do it? Uh, a, as a demonstration of their capability. And some would even take that further and say, that was that was a warning sign. That was a, you know, statement of capability. That was a statement to leave us, you know, yeah. we are an emerging power in space. I think that was the message. Um, and honestly, at the time, I, you know, I've been in 32 years. Uh, at the time, I don't think that was readily apparent even to us in the military. I, I think it, it took a little bit of time to uh, evaluate what they, had done, um, and really from there they've been growing. They've been growing a space capability, um, and it's not just 
a GPS equivalent or communication satellites. I mean, they are they are growing uh, and building and launching testing um, capabilities that could threaten ours. So I believe that um, we can't just sit on our hands. Uh, we, we can't sit back and let our domain go unprotected. And uh, there is competition in space now. I, there's, there's competition with Russia and China on many, many things. In all, in all of our other um, instruments of power, you know, uh, economically we have competition, um, information wise we have competition <laughs> and that's flaring up as, as we read in, in, uh, in the news. Um, and so, you know, I think Americans should look at the Space Force as a, a pro number one, a protectorate of our assets in space. Um, and no one wants a, a weapons race in space, that's for sure. No one wants war in space. We wanna protect the domain for its peaceful use, you know, but also for the use of all those exquisite capabilities I mentioned for our own military so that we can protect the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So another area that one of our uh, one of the people who's uh, watching asked about is uh, another risk uh, is space debris, and you oh, talked yeah. about the example of you know the Chinese blowing up their own weather satellite. But we've been launching a lot of stuff up for a long time, and as I understand it, there is a ton of debris um, out out there. To what extent um, is that part of your is that part of your brief to um, protect our capabilities against just all the junk floating around that we're trying to not have um, do damage? Right now, debris mitigation is not a military mission. Uh, where that may go in the future, I, I really don't know. We haven't been talking about that. Uh, it's more of a scientific endeavor. It, it is more of a NASA endeavor. Um, but it, it definitely is an issue. I can tell you that from a military perspective, when we launch a rocket, when we deliver a satellite, um, well, first of all, from the launch, um, we basically, by understanding where all the other objects are in space, we, we kind of clear a path, if you will, for that rocket to safely deliver the satellite to its intended orbit. Um, and so that's a, that's a way of debris mitigation. Um, also, once that satellite is delivered um, and, you know, say it would um, live its full life, there are procedures at the end of the life of a satellite to put it into a debris orbit, basically. It's, you know, we call it the graveyard orbit, but it is, you know, it's a debris orbit. It, there's, there are um, procedures that must be followed uh, at the end of a satellite's life. So um, there are, uh, there are, I know there are um, scientific, you know, uh, capabilities being explored. I've seen things as, you know, crazy as, um, and, and it's actually probably technically not so crazy. It just sounds crazy um, <laughs> that you would, you know, maybe put a big net up there and, and um, capture the debris. Um, you know, that might not be as, as, as insane as, as it sounds, but there are, there's a lot of people thinking hard about debris. Mm -hmm. And on the military side, we uh, feel like we're being good to, stewards of space by mitigating debris with our procedures and our operations. Mm -hmm. We've got another question, which is really to the, uh, it also goes to a scope question of uh, what kinds of threats are uh, you charged with, um, with thinking about. And um, uh, we've been talking about a lot of terrestrial threats, adversaries on, on Earth, um, which could provide a threat. And this question really is about 
Um, first, natural things like meteors and other things that could threaten the security of our, our country and our, 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 our planet. Um, and the question even goes as far as uh, alien, uh, alien forces. Um, to what extent uh, is, is the Space Corps um, charged with um, you know, threats coming from, uh, not from Earth uh, through space, but from space into Earth? Right now, we are not charged with with those, with monitoring those threats. Um, in the course of using those radars and, and, um, and telescopes that I mentioned earlier, we may assist NASA and other uh, organizations, uh, academia, uh, with deep space monitoring, but our role is purely to monitor what's in orbit. We're, we are not the organization for uh, extraterrestrial or earthbound threats, uh, not, not today. Um, we are, however, thinking about, um, because you know, our current charge is uh, the objects in orbit around Earth. Uh, but if you think about exploration and as we uh, explore the moon again and, and continue to explore Mars and potentially other planets, um, you, you, you think about expanding that, that role. You think about um, maybe a protection and defense of beyond what is the traditional Earth orbits into potentially the cis lunar orbit. And we've started to think about um, that kind of capability. Today, we don't, we don't have that capability, um, but but it is it's it's not a it's not a crazy question to to be asking these things, um, and uh, and so you know it, your future space force may be very active outside of the bounds of Earth orbit. So within the Earth orbit, one of the challenges that uh, you have is standing up. A new um, a new service in the midst of a very robust set of existing um, armed services, which no doubt have developed their own capabilities to deal with the space things, uh, the space issues that have been a primary concern um, with them. And in any organization where you have uh, you know, multiple pieces, there's always rivalry among um, you know among different parts of the organization, and and you've got a challenge of developing a new set of capabilities that I would imagine optimally is used by all the other services. Could you talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges in becoming, I suppose, a trusted partner um, to those other services and how are you dealing, uh, dealing with that? One of our first challenges was uh, because the other services do actively use space, uh, how much should the other services contribute to the space, to the new space force, and one of our our first challenges was personnel, staffing, manning, manpower, and um, uh, so that was one of the first things that uh, we had an initial planning team. It was kind of a, a team that planned to plan to stand up the space force, and one of the first things they did was engage the other services for help for personnel. Um, and not money yet. We we haven't gotten to to that. I'll I'll get to that discussion. Um, but but for for personnel, the army was very generous in sending over soldiers, and many of them with space experience. Um, really, I mean, both actually, all services, the army, the navy, and the marines, have sent people over, and and they've sent really good people, really strong skill sets, uh, uh, officers and enlisted, but officers who are going places. So, you know, officers who aren't just turning around to retire in the next year, they, uh, for example, my, um, my executive officer, he, he, he's already been, in the time I've, I've had him in the last six months, he was selected for promotion. So the Navy knew that he was promotable, right? And he's also been selected for command 
and been given his command ship. So these are not slugs, you know. Right. So right. it's been it's been uh, it's been very positive in that way. But then we have to get into the permanent transfer of personnel, the permanent transfer of capabilities that exist in other services. And we're mostly, I think I would say our agreement is about 95%. And there are there are some capabilities within um, the various services that we're, we're just continuing to negotiate on. It's, you know, you can imagine the other services that didn't say, yeah, you can have whatever you want, Space Force. Uh, it was a logical, uh, you know, plan out, discussion, decide, and then there's a, there's a few that we still have to work on. Um, and as far as budget, yeah. I think we've done a really good job this year. The Air Force, we, we are part of the Department of the Air Force. The Air Force carved out about 10% of the total Air Force budget and allocated it to the Space Force, and that is our budget to control. Um, of course, my boss says, well, that was our budget already and that, you know, that's what we were already using, <laughs> uh, which he's right. But I, you know, that was a, that was a, it was a calculated amount. What is, what does space, you know, have today? Where's a little bit of growth? And, um, you know, now, to be honest, it's growing a service that has relationships with the other services. Um, you know, they're going to look to us to deliver on the promise of a new service that is agile, lean, nimble, that we can quickly uh, come up with new capabilities that we can provide the best uh, capabilities from space as we've been providing and continue that excellence. It, it's, it's time to deliver on that. We, I think we have been, but that's one of the things that uh, is going to prove ourselves to our sister services moving forward. Terrific. So I'll just remind uh, those who are tuned in, if you'd like to ask a question, and a number of you have, and I'll get to those uh, more of those in just a minute, but just open a new browser window and type in ccga.live, and then you can do that. So let me shift gears a little bit and just ask you about your career. And I suppose this connects to where you started at the beginning of the conversation about how in our country we all have uh, an obligation and a role to play in, um, in our national defense. And I think one of the exciting developments that I've seen really progress in, in, in my lifetime has been the advancement of, of women uh, within the military. And you are an example of one of the highest ranking female members in the military. You've been in the service um, you know, several years, as you've indicated. And I just wanted to just ask for what your, are your reflections about um, how the role of women in the military have changed throughout your career and kind of where do you see this going? I, uh, I definitely remember when I was a second lieutenant looking around and there was no woman really in sight. I mean, <laughs> I certainly had no women bosses and uh, there were very few women I was the only woman officer uh, at my first assignment at Beale Air Force Base in California, uh, one of the ground-based radars I mentioned earlier that tracks um, satellites and also is responsible for missile warning for the nation. Um, it was a, a, a fantastic job, important role, but I looked around and I saw no, no women leaders until I got to my second assignment. Um, you can fast forward to today and the Department of the Air Force is leading the way with women as leaders, um, leading the way with diversity and inclusion. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty proud to be part of uh, the organization. I, and you know, to be in this position, have the opportunity to continue to lead uh, as a, you know, as a, basically as an officer first, but also as a woman. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I think we've come a long way, but I also believe there's, there's a ways, there's a ways to go. I, I still, uh, attend meetings where I may be the only woman in the room. Um, 
if the meeting is with our secretary, she sits at the head of the table, which I'm pretty proud to see a woman at the head of the table. And actually, she's so the third Air Force. Yeah, secretary yeah she, of the Air Force. she's the third consecutive secretary of the Air Force uh, who's who's a woman. So I, uh, it's it's awesome to see. Um, but but I think we need to do a better job of recruiting women and retaining women. Mm -hmm. um, we want to recruit the right people for the Space Force. And, and because we're a, a technically, we lean technical as, as an organization, you know, we want to uh, help um, society, help uh, communities attract women to STEM. You know, uh, I remember, this is gonna sound a little corny, but I remember as a kid, um, at my elementary school there in, uh, I think I went to Whittier Elementary School in Oak Park. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Iliff was my kindergarten teacher and she somehow sparked in me a joy in, of learning. I mean, I, I loved learning to read. I loved learning math. I loved science. I, you know, I mean, you remember growing plants out of Dix Dixie cups? <laughs> I, you know, she, she somehow got to me, you know, she, and she sparked in me this joy of learning. It's not just fun. It's, it's, a, it's joyful. And, uh, and somehow she made math and science approachable for me as a little girl. And I don't, I don't know how to crack that code, but I think we as a nation need to figure that out. And, uh, and then when you, when you, when you look at, okay, we, we have recruited high talent, how do we retain talent? Yeah. When women want to have a family, um, sometimes it takes them out of this competitive ladder everyone's on. And we have to figure out how, you know, I think how to redefine that ladder. Does it really mean step after step after step like this? Or can we you know, ebb and flow and, and still build and groom amazing leaders who potentially didn't have to take every single step that a man would along the way. Um, we, we're really thinking about that hard in the Space Force because in the end we, we recruit talent, but we retain families and we we're thinking about um, really a unique ways of doing that right now. Yeah. So I've got a question that, that goes to, well, first of all, let me say thank you for sharing that. I, I think that's incredibly important. And, uh, you know, it's essential in an area like ourself, uh, like our defense, uh, for us to use all the talent that exists inside the, inside the country and uh, making mm -hmm. ways for that to be possible and successful, I, I agree, is critically important and appreciate you sharing that. I want to ask, and this would probably be about the final question that we'll have time for, but um, again, it harkens, it's from our one of our the people tuned in, and it goes back to your um, you know, urging for people to get involved um, in national defense. And I've got a question uh, from one of our attendees. As a civilian, how can I join the Space Force team? Oh, oh I wish I had the 1-800 number. I would give it to you right now. <laughs> Um, I wish I could, I wish I could do that. Uh, and I'm not armed with that. I, I'm so sorry. That's okay. We can um, post it. One of the wonderful things is this will be available online and we okay. can post it in the notes. For I will get back to you. But are there roles for, for civilians? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We not only have officers and enlisted, we have civilian and we have many, many civilian positions in every category um, you can imagine in space. Um, civilians are on our operations floors. If you kind of think about where, it, if that's where the rubber meets the road, when you're, you know, communicating with a GPS satellite, for example, or, or um, optimizing uh, a communications segment for uh, something going on in Iraq or Afghanistan. Civilians are part of every every step of the way they're they're with us they're part of our our core and then there's also contractors i mean we we hire and we have really good partnerships with 
contractors, defense contractors, and, and others that are also amazing partners. So you, you don't have to raise your right hand in the military, but you may, you may raise your right hand uh, as, a, as a civilian. And, and we have plenty, plenty of opportunities in all, all aspects. That's terrific. And, and with that call to action, um, our time has uh, come to a close here. I want to just thank our audience for, for tuning in today and, uh, and let you know that this will be posted online and the, uh, the council's webpage. So feel free to share it with others who you think would be interested in it. And Lieutenant General, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us about a space, the Space Force. It's brand new um, and uh, people are trying to understand how this, uh, what it is and how it fits in. And you've done a great job of, of sharing that with, uh, with us and look forward to seeing you in person here in Chicago. We'll try to keep the sports teams going and maybe when you come back, it will be possible to go into a stadium and watch uh, one of them play in person. <laughs> That would be amazing. I'd love to come back home. All right. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Thank you, sir.